can um, we get an approval of the agenda? Can I get a motion and a second? So moved. Okay, second. moved by Livingston, second by Peltzman. All in favor say aye. 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 And all opposed say nay. Okay, we have an approved agenda. Um, the first thing on the agenda is a, a achievement, the retirees. Good evening, Oops. Chair Yenner and directors of the board. I'm very pleased that tonight we are celebrating two groups that we are honoring this evening. The first are um, employees who have retired or will soon be retiring from District 622. And so I'm gonna just read through this list of names. Um, as you know, as school board members know, we do honor all of our retirees with a handwritten card from our from, signed by each one of us, school board members and myself, and those, um, we are continually sending those out to retirees and looking at their work history with our district. So I'd like to just take a moment and share with you, um, these are names of folks who have retired since December um, and through this summer. So I'm just gonna go through that list. And then our second group that we're gonna be honoring this evening are um, students who have been awarded the bilingual seal. So we're gonna talk about that in just a few minutes as well. So of the employees who have or will soon be retiring, D. Michelle Finn, teacher at Eagle Point, Peggy Knowles, building and assistant weaver, Skip Metcalf, maintenance garage, Bradley Martinson, arena manager, Christian Kranich, cafe assistant at North, Charles Oswald, maintenance mechanic at the DEC, Lori Wall, teacher uh, at WDW, District-wide, thank you. <laughs> Robert Dunham, <laughs> I was like, hold on a minute. Robert Dunham, um, Community of Building Supervisor. Janet Ringsred, Media Ed Assistant Richardson. Sherry Wollers, Special Ed Para Tartan. Dave Jungman, HVAC Technician, Transportation. Craig Kane, Beaver Lake Engineer. Sue Bartling, Harmony Supervisor. Keither Campbell, Arena Supervisor. Cheryl Geispers, Adult Program Coordinator. Christine Roski, Roski uh, McMillan, speech and language pathologist at Carver. Anne Marie Johnson, transitions teacher, next step. Cynthia Epland, teacher, Eagle Point. Mary Fowler, LPN, non public, DEC. Lisa Frampton, teacher, Justice Page. Kim Harvo, cafeteria manager, Eagle Point. Robert Horner, bus garage, our bus monitor, bus garage. Colleen Crank, Media Ed Assistant, Tartan. Mary Lavolette, Pre-K Ed Assistant, Justice Page. Kay Slack, Teacher Gladstone. Lynn Tierney, Teacher Cowan. Julie Tucci, Elementary Manager, Cafeteria Manager, Weaver. Mary Kay Olson, Gladstone, CE Community Ed Clerk. Marnie Sanders, Justice Allen Page, AC Program Assistant. Sarah Saunders, Weaver Cafeteria Assistant. Daniel Travers, North Custodian. Kathy Schallhorn, John Glenn, Media Ed Assistant. Laura Cashmitter, Castle Intervention Ed Assistant. Sandra Sutterfield, Beaver Lake, ECSE Teacher. And Julie Weyer, North Secretary. And I'd like to just thank all of our employees who have dedicated incredible years and years of experience and expertise to us here in 622 and it's been a true honor um, to work with these retirees uh, as you can see they they have brought so many different gifts and talents to 622 and it's such a sad thing to see our folks retiring and at the same time really really honoring and respectful of all of the years they've put in and and well-deserved retirement and of course, we always hope someday people may want to come back to us for a little bit of extra post-retirement employment. Um, but just a, a heartfelt thank you to everyone who has served our district in so many, many different capacities. Let's hear it for our retirees. The next 
area that we're going to be celebrating this evening, I'm going to have our uh, Director of Research Evaluation and Assessment, Amy Luckner, come up and share with you some information about our Bilingual SEALs Award recipients. Thank you. Do we have anyone needing interpreting? Anyone here need interpreting? Alguien necesita español? No? Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Good evening, Chair Yenner, Directors of the Board, Superintendent Tutu Osorio, and Cabinet. Um, it is really my honor and privilege to be here to celebrate our Bilingual SEAL graduates. So I want to start with first giving you a little bit of background information about the Bilingual SEALs program in case you're not familiar, and then we'll be honoring our individual uh, students who have achieved this award and recognition. So Minnesota has a Bilingual SEALs program um, that provides districts an opportunity to award the Minnesota Bilingual or Multilingual SEALs to students who demonstrate proficiency in a language other than English. So it's an, an optional program, and so across the state there are 54 districts who offer bilingual SEALs, which is really kind of a, a small percentage of all of our districts, but we are really proud to be one of those districts um, to offer this program and to really use this program as a way of recognizing and valuing the importance of speaking more than one language fluently. So students who demonstrate proficiency um, in another language other than English and also complete their required uh, English language arts credits earn a bilingual seal once they graduate. And students demonstrate their proficiency in another language by completing an assessment and they can do that either in 10th, 11th, or 12th grade. Um, and that includes the, the demonstration of proficiency both or in all of the modalities, including listening, reading, speaking, and writing. Based on the level of proficiency that they demonstrate, they can achieve up three different levels of awards. Uh, the first level is the World Language Proficiency Certificate. And so that um, is when they're showing intermediate low proficiency. Then there's the bilingual gold seal level, which is intermediate high level of proficiency. And then there's bilingual platinum seal, which is advanced low level proficiency. And that's the highest level that we have. Those levels are determined um, by the American Council on the Teaching of Foreign Language. And so they have a rubric for how they determine what, what meets those different levels. The advantage of this program, um, first of all and foremost, of course, is really being able to value the um, bilingualism uh, that we have. But also, the students who achieve this level earn uh, additional elective credits at the high school level um, to honor the skills that they are demonstrating. They also may be eligible to earn college credit. Uh, so this is kind of a breakdown of what college credit they would be eligible to earn at Minsky institutions. So at Minnesota State Colleges and Universities, um, this would be kind of the level, if you're at a, one of these levels, you would then achieve um, or be eligible for going into college with those number of credits earned. So that's a real advantage uh, as well. Other institutions may also honor it, um, but that would be up to the individual institution. Um, and students would work with that institution to determine that. So this is kind of our, our progress in our program. Our program is really growing, which we're excited about. Um, the, the data here are the students who have tested. So some of them are not yet graduated yet, so they haven't officially um, gotten their award. Um, but when they test, we keep track of the number of students who've passed the assessment in their target language, as well as the potential number of college credits that they might earn should they go on um, to redeem those. And so you can see here in the past four years, uh, we've been growing the program. In 2023, we had 98 students who demonstrated proficiency on the assessment. Um, and that is equivalent to a potential of up to 234 credits across all of our the students who passed. And that was a growth from in 2022, we had 81 students. Uh, but you can see it's really grown every year uh, since 2020. In 2023, these are the languages where we had students who demonstrated proficiency. Um, so it's always very exciting to see that. Um, the majority of our students who are testing um, at a proficient level are speaking Spanish. 
And then the next highest was Hmong and then French. Um, but it's exciting to see we had some other languages as well, including uh, Somali, Amharic, Arabic, Chinese or Mandarin, uh, Oromo, and Vietnamese. For, comparis for comparison, we also have here the languages that tested in 2022, if you're curious or interested. And then I want to um, move on to the next part where we can congratulate our students who earned, our graduates who've earned a bilingual seal. So again, these would be students who tested proficiently either in 10th, 11th, and 12th grade while they were in our district and then just recently graduated. So they now have also met their English language arts requirement and we can honor them. So it's very exciting. Before we start with that, are, are there any questions about the SEALS program in general? Excellent. We can always talk about it another time as well. So this first level, again, this is the kind of the, the first level of proficiency that students can demonstrate. Students at this level um, would potentially be eligible for up to two semesters of college credit. So that shows the kind of proficiency that they're demonstrating. So congratulations to those students. Do you want to tell what's next? Yes, I'll yeah. be. So then the next level um, is our next highest level proficiency. So these are students who are demonstrating proficiency that would be equivalent to uh, a year and a half of college level language work. So this is the bilingual gold seal level. All right. So I'm going to read off the names of the students who have achieved the bilingual gold seal level. And if I call your name, we, um, we have invited students, but you know, at this time of year, it's not always easy to get everybody here. So if I do call your name, we're going to have you come on up and we'll have a certificate for you. Okay, so we have one in this category. We'll start right away. Um, Ulysses Rodriguez is one who has won the gold seal. Come on up. Stand here for a moment. Let's. Uh, I want to do a quick photo with her. Um, Josh can do that. So um, we'll just. I'll be shaking your hand. How about that? <laughs> well, act natural. Very candid, right? <laughs> Excellent job. Congratulations. <laughs> And I'm going to go down the list of others who have received the Minnesota Bilingual Gold Seal. These are seniors, correct? Amy? Yes. Seniors that have achieved the Bilingual Gold Seal. Genesis Aguilar, Miguel Ruben Andrade Kemper, Carla Contreras, Jose De La Rosa, Emeline Duque. Make sure I move. Did it move? Okay. Karina Mancia Guevara. Jimmy Nunez Soriano, Anali Preus, Zitlali Ramirez, Dulesi Rodriguez, Daphne Sagnueu, did I say that? Sagnueu, uh, Yonju, I think I got that right, maybe. Diana Salguero, Cassandra Santiago Hernandez, Lisbeth Vasquez, Sheng Shong. Uh, oop, okay. Oh, we have some more. Excellent. Bienvenidos. <laughs> let's double check. Um, let's double check which okay. family just arrived so we don't miss anybody. Perfect. So now we're going to talk about um, and honor our students who've achieved the highest level 
of Bilingual Seal Award. These are our students, our graduates, who also demonstrated a high level of proficiency in another, another language to receive the Bilingual Platinum Seal. All right, so this is a really big honor. The first um, is Ariel Aguilon Payez, Van Fuang Bui. Um, this one I think we have here, Roxana Ma Masariego Fernandez. Roxana, si quiere venir acá. Continuing on with our bilingual platinum seal, Caitlin Rodriguez Campos. Stephanie Rodriguez Salguero, who we know very well. Yasmin Sandoval. All right, come on up. Just as a reminder, for those who've earned our, many, many of our students are bilingual, um, but to be passing this exam at that high of a level means you're incredibly bilingual and biliterate. Um, and it's a pretty uh, remarkable honor to be able to pass this exam at such a high level. And another requirement of earning this certificate is also passing your high school English classes as well, because obviously we have to make sure that people are truly bilingual in English as well. And so um, it's a true honor to be able to recognize our students who are incredibly bilingual and biliterate as well. And so um, we're so proud of all the work that you've put into this. I know it's not an easy, it's not an easy test at all. And we're just incredibly grateful to all of our students who have passed this exam and, and grateful to our families who have supported them as well. So let's hear it for the let's see it one more time. Any questions from our school board members? Yeah, I do. I want to congratulate all the students that received the bilingual skills because it's 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 such a huge achievement and it's gonna it's pushing them ahead actually in higher education also because uh, I work in higher education and we do recognize uh, the skills uh, for college credits so. Uh, kudos to you. Um, but I also wanted to put a plug out for those individuals that couldn't take, didn't hit, have an opportunity to take the exam, that they have up to three years, MDE does allow up to three years to do it. So if you missed out on chance, those of you that got it today, tell your friends, you can still take it. And if you are within Minnesota State Colleges and University System, we do honor it up to three years after graduation. And it's free, so, you know, yep. All right. Thank you. OK, thanks, Amy. All right. Thanks and congratulations again to the retirees and the bilingual SEAL recipients. Um, next, we have public comment. And we do have a public comment today. So public comment's an opportunity for, wait, let me pull it up. An opportunity for the public to comment on items. Speakers shall complete a registration, state their name and address, and we'll have 
up to four minutes, depending on the number of speakers, and today there's one, so. Um, to speak on the topic. The public comment section of the meeting shall last no longer than 30 minutes. So the public, um, the person who signed up for public comment is Carla, maybe, Rosh? Sorry if I pronounced that last name wrong. Hello, and thanks for the opportunity to do this, to speak with you tonight. Uh, my name is Clara Roosh, and I've been employed with 622 in one way or another since 2016. I have just finished my second year as an intervention education assistant at Carver Elementary. I really struggled quite a bit in trying to decide what to write and how to say it for you this evening, because this is and is not about the challenges of teaching in an open learning space while troubled students are screaming and throwing things down the hall from you. This is and is not about how many times support staff get hit or kicked or bitten or sworn at. This is not about my friend Therese, who after 14 years at Carver quit mid-year because she was tired of being spat upon. Rather, this is about how we serve the kids who are doing the screaming, swearing, kicking, and spitting at us. Why do we do this job if those are the circumstances? Because deep down, deep down, we know it's not the kids' fault that these behaviors are the only ways they know how to express themselves. And we know it's not the kids' fault that they are one, two, or even three years behind in their scholastic abilities. But we have the hubris or the arrogance or the unfaltering hope that we can make a difference, a positive difference, in these kids' lives in education. So I would like to talk to you today about three specific students I worked with this year. Not using real names, of course. The first is Kenny. He is a fourth grader who is reading at a first grade level. Many strategies have been tried over the years to help with Kenny's reading. I was asked to work with a, continue working with a method that had just been started. And the method focuses on identifying and marking patterns of letters and to learn rules that pertain to those patterns. For example, example the word tried would be marked like this. Consonants that work together, a long, uh, two vowel rules, you cross out the second vowel, lose your long vowel there, and another consonant. And it was working. Kenny was growing in his reading, but as importantly, he was growing in confidence and in his participation in all subjects. But English is filled with as many exceptions as it is rules, and the word triad, would be marked the same as tried. The, the, the programs we have to use are not perfect. So he made progress, but there's obviously more work to be done. Then there's Steffi, a third grader whose math work was at a low kindergarten level. We started with 10 blocks, which looked like this, sorry. Long rectangle indicating 10 and the individual is eating, indicating one. So we asked her to count, and she would count 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. So we backed up to single digit addition and subtraction. She would add six plus three by putting the number six in her head and counting on from her fingers to come up with nine. When presented with the next problem of six plus four, she started over, putting six in her head and counting on by her fingers to get to 10. She could not recognize that I increased the problem by just one, which would increase her answer by just one. The numbers do not have any relationship to each other in her head. 
there's more work to be done. Finally, there's Dottie, another third grader who was far behind in reading. She was in my group working on CVC words, consonant, vowel, consonant, sort of the first section of words you learn in any level. She knew what to do and how to put the sounds together, but she did this very slowly. In a time-skilled check, near the end of our first session together, she perfectly read 13 CVC words in one minute. That means it took her this long to read the word fog. Dottie was eager to learn and was trying so hard. She would get frustrated when her learning was interrupted by peers. For instance, the time I had to work with a child who had written, I apologize, this in his notebook. Kenny, Steffi, and Dottie are not unique. There are hundreds of students who need academic support and not nearly enough EAs to meet the need. Carver had three open EA positions for the entirety of the 22-23 school year. I know that wages and benefits are not the only reason that these positions remained open, but I also know that wages and benefits are a reason that you can do something about. Being short-staffed meant that there were students' needs who were not being met. We failed them. You failed them. In Carver's intervention group, there are seven this year. Two of us have second jobs. Two of us live with our parents. I fall into the board housewife or, re or retiree category. None of us could rely on this job as our so only source of income. My monthly take-home income is averages about $1,540. Which is about what it costs to pay for monthly health insurance. Please don't continue to fail us. Give us a tangible reason to believe that what we do is worthwhile. Let us know you recognize that we go home to our own families exhausted, discouraged, bruised, and still come back the next day. Thank you. Um. All right, thank you. Um, next on our agenda is the consent agenda. Um, tonight on the consent agenda, we have minutes of the May 16th, 2023 business meeting, minutes of the June 6th, 2023 work study session, routine personnel, bid award, change orders, disbursements, RFP awards. So the consent agenda, uh, let me pull Be it resolved by the School Board of Independent School District 622 that the consent agenda items A through G be approved as written and a copy of the items in the agenda are attached to the minutes. Um, do any board members want to remove anything from the consent agenda? If not, can I, can I get a motion and a second to approve? So moved. Okay, moved by Natardi. Second. Second by Yang. All in favor say aye. Aye. And all opposed say nay. The consent agenda is approved. Um, next, we have reports and the superintendent. Yes. Our first report, sorry. Our first report, uh, one moment here. We actually have a couple of guest presentations this evening here. Um, sorry, do we have, I lost my place. Thank you. Adult basic ed, thank you. We have our adult basic education and adult programs coming and I don't know, Tamara Lennox is our director of community ed, but we have um, our adult basic ed team. Do you guys want to come on up? I don't know if you have any pre. Can you put the uh, slides to the adult basic ed on the screen? Thank you. So as, as stated, Tamara Lennox is the community ed director that uh, both Jordy Telliard's way and myself work, work under um, and uh, support, supported in 
the Harmony Adult Education. I uh, want to thank the kind faces and familiar faces that I see here just from my recent GED graduation over at uh, Gladstone. But uh, Harmony Adult Education. And you are Scott. Hi, my name is Scott Helland. And thank you. I've been, I've been uh, around for about 16, 17 years now in uh, North St. Paul ISD 622. And thank you, uh, board members and, and superintendent, for having me here today to talk about the adult basic education. Um, Harmony Adult Education has under its umbrella English as a Second Language, GED, and Career Pathways. The GED and the High Set. High Set is another version of like a GED, a, a, a HSED, a High School Equivalency Diploma that is is coming to Minnesota. It's something that that we're looking at going with around August this year. Uh, both the GED and the high set will be free on the first uh, attempt for students to take, so there's no cost to the individuals. Always uh, studying at Harmony is, uh, is at no cost to individuals. English is second language. We have it at multiple sites. We have it online. We started online uh, during the pandemic, and we've continued it because of the fact that, um, not necessarily for, not, not for health concerns, but for the fact that uh, folks with transportation barriers, and childcare have for years and years and years not been able to attend ESL classes, and we finally figured out a way that, that meets their needs and meets our needs, and uh, and it, it's been successful. So we've continued on in addition to our, our in-person classes. Metro-Rear's Career Pathways is, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but it's with Roseville and Moundsview uh, Adult Basic Ed class schools. And then uh, the Adult Basic Ed, it's, not very well named. I've only had 16, 17 years to fix it, but uh, it, it ends up being the, the best term. So it's for our students who come to us who are lower than a GED level, kind of native speakers. So it's, it's more improving reading. Where are we? Uh, Harmony Building at 1961 County Road C East over on White Bear Ave. We're online. We're at Beaver Lake. We're at Normandy Park. So, so we offer at a, a number of different sites. The Beaver Lake and Normandy Park are with our uh, early childhood uh, uh, programming. So that's parents coming with their kids. So the parents are being pulled out to work with uh, uh, English language while the, the children are working on, on their items as well. Who are Harmony students? Uh, you can see that there's, there's a large amount of Hispanic, a large amount of of black or African American, a large amount of uh, Asian students, and it's it's logical that when you're pulling from folks from all across the 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 world, that uh, that that's who that's who we're serving at, at our best. So when, when we talk about English as a second language, we're talking about almost uh, kind of the things that we talk about on the bilingual seals speaking, writing, listening. We're talking about adults. We're talking about folks that uh, we might see a few, especially this time of year, 17, 18 year olds who, who high school didn't quite come to completion. They might be looking at a GED. Just had a, a young lady in today that, you know, dad and her sitting down and they're like, you know, this is, this is what we need to do in order to get to the next uh, spot in life. There's no cost to students. Classes are offered at uh, two, uh, two locations and online. Over a thousand students participated this year. Now, interestingly enough, so right before the pandemic, uh, there were, we, we were serving a number of students. Right now, we're serving 93% of the same volume of students that we were prior to that. The state average is like 74%. So we really bounced back to, to serving folks. And in part, we did that because we were uh, some of the folks that, that opened up and, and were able to uh, serve folks at a, at a pace that has allowed them to come back to us. Um, beautiful photo here of, uh, of a GED graduate and their family, because it's not just the person who graduates, it's, it's the entire family that benefits. GED is a self-paced drop-in learning program. It's not everybody aggregates into the same level, so it's not today's math class is fractions, it's not today's English class is this, it's come to us where you're at, we'll work with you, we'll get you over to where you need to be. Um, I said August-ish uh, because uh, the, the, uh, the state legislature passed a, a, a levy in order to go ahead and pay for the, uh, um, the GED first time testing. And I expect that that'll be probably August or September that it will be free to students. Right now there is a cost. Um, 
the official GED uh, testing is on site at Harmony. Harmony is actually the largest GED preparation or G largest GED testing site in the entire state of Minnesota, um, which you don't think when you drive by on White Bear Ave that hey that looks like the largest GED testing site. You think <laughs> you think it'd be somewhere else, but but we really we really expand our hours. We're there from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. and that's what people need, and people have responded by by coming to us in droves. Uh, graduation next year, uh, May 15th, and the graduation is for GED and our CNA program. The CNA is our certified nursing assistants. We have that for, uh, we work along with uh, Century College in order to get folks kind of that extra level of, uh, of being able to work. Um, this is one of our students. You can check it out online. Uh, it's just a, a nice little video of her telling us about what it is that she enjoys about Harmony. Here we have a gentleman sitting in our class doing the Metro East Career Pathways. A lot of our Metro East Career Pathways works with students uh, to get IT skills. So getting those IT skills to participate in today's society is something that uh, really helps folks out. We also have a uh, paraprofessional. Um, so folks can get into being a paraprofessional with either two years of college or passing the paraeducator or parapro. So we help them with passing the paraprofessional test. And then the healthcare careers is, is mainly our CNA class. So folks getting into being able to work. Both of those careers are, are ones that are greatly in need. I wear a few different hats yeah, as always uh, CFO. You know, Andrews. sometimes we must be making some chief money for the mixing business. officer. I'm often there first. And I think that's the bit that I really enjoy. Just a little taste of uh, what we have to offer in terms of once folks have done some ESL with us or done some uh, uh, GED preparation with us, some of the other options that they have were, were some of those fields. We also have a citizenship class, basic skills brush up math and reading, online classes in both the AM and the PM, and then just to give you an idea of, well, you know, where's, where's the health of Harmony Adult Education? basic education. This May we serve more hours of students than any month in the history of, of Harmony Adult Education. So uh, definitely folks are finding a need for the service. They're, they're coming to us because they're pro being provided with something that's valuable to them. Uh, these are some of our partners within, uh, we're, we're also, 622 runs the consortium for the financing for the other programs such as Roseville, Stillwater, Moundsview. Scred all the way up, you can see along the map there. And I'll just kind of end with the fact that, uh, you know, when you, when you look at the small little school over there at Harmony, there's, there's a thousand adults coming through there every year uh, that, are, that are helping get some of their needs met and that we are right now uh, definitely serving folks at a, at a higher rate than the rest of the state. And I think that, that bodes well because of our, our teachers and the quality of staff and the support from Tamara that we have. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. I could make a quick oh, comment yeah, too, if, just because Scott isn't going to brag about himself, but um, you should also know that he is down at the legislature all the time testifying and he has, he's very recognized 
down at the legislature because of his advocacy work. And, and so not only has he done a nice job with the programming, but he's really helped um, educate lawmakers in general about the kinds of programs and the kind of things that, that go on not only at Harmony, but around our state. And so I just wanted to point that out because I know you are very, very well recognized at the state capitol. And this year it actually works, so we're yep. getting some additional funding. Yep. <laughs> uh, Scott, yes. Just yes. Oh, I just uh, wanted to say, Scott, that I'm, I'm just so proud that we can offer this program. And, um, you know, when you talk about um, uh, how motivation is so important uh, in learning, these folks are really motivated. And I love going to this graduation because uh, you can just see the, the pride. Um, so I, I uh, Again, just kudos to you for keeping the program going and growing. I think it's awesome. Um, yeah, and um, the uh, and then the online part is really is really great that we've opened access to. Uh, to I've, I've really struggled for years. We've tried a number of different things, including uh, on-site childcare, different different options, and, and the online really has been the best one at, at helping those folks that can't make it to us through transportation and or. Uh, just, you know, somebody else in the family is working and then they have child care responsibilities, so still being able to meet their, their English needs, it's, it's really worked well. Right. And, um, and I've run into you a lot when I worked for the Minnesota Senate. And um, also, I, I still think about uh, this wonderful volunteer who passed away suddenly. Um, was it three years ago now, Al Fox? Only, only two, I think. Two years Al, ago. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, you uh, um, are very uh, fortunate to have these these volunteers that come in. Do you, can you say some more about your volunteers? Sure. So, well, just you mentioned Al Fox, and the, the Al Fox Harmony of Spirit of Harmony Award is 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 something that you know kind of recognizes those students who just kind of recognize that spirit of harmony that we do in our uh, our spring celebration, but. The, the volunteers that come into us work one-to-one -one with students in order to uh, help students kind of go from point A to point G really, really quickly. Because no matter how many times, you know, if, uh, if you get that opportunity one-to-one -one with somebody reading back and forth, it just really can just, you know, put the gas on it and increase your ability to learn. And that's what volunteers do for us underneath the, uh, the, the teachers who are saying, Hey, work on this with them. Work on that with them, and then and then they just get to see people just blossom. Right, right. I mean, Al, I think was an engineer or you know, highly yep, retired skilled. from three M. Yep, retired from three M. Highly skilled professional. Never imagined he'd be a teacher. He said, <laughs> but uh, just found so much satisfaction in doing that work. So, um, so anyway, thanks for for all the work that you do. Thank you. Yeah, I want to echo what Nancy said about the work that you do in the community. Um, I, I also enjoy attending the graduations because I know how much impact it does in the community because these are families in the community. These are parents or children that are also attending our schools. And um, the uh, social mobility that this program it provides it's it's unbelievable but i also want to thank you for also welcoming the new immigrants and uh, uh, supporting them through the educational system as one that came myself um, as an immigrant in the educational system and i really appreciate it when people help me through and uh, help me succeed uh, every step of the way and your program does that to to our new immigrants in the community and so thank you for doing that we, we came the building came with the name harmony but i think harmony means a little bit more than the building that we just happen to reside in uh that that sense of community that that folks get in new immigrants and folks that have been here a long time just that sense of belonging in a community it it, it brings a wealth to to folks it's it's awesome Thank you. All right, thanks very much. Thank you. Um, next on the agenda, we have activities and athletics report. Oh, wait, no, we still have a second part to this. We've got oh, Jordy. Oh, sorry, sorry. For those who don't who remember Cheryl Geisper, Cheryl used to be our um, 
our coordinator overseeing the program for our senior citizens. And now we've got Jordy, who has used to work with Scott, now coming over to work in that program at Gladstone. And um, we're just really grateful that uh, we have him in this role now. And, and he's going to share a little bit about our, our other adult and senior programs. Are we going to hear about the senior prom and the... Uh... Yes, oh, yes, yes, yes. Yes, that, that <laughs> yes. is all under Jordy. OK, so yes, my name is uh, Jordi Teatswe. And then Amy, actually, I'm hoping that my daughter will graduate with the um, bilingual seal in French. Oh, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> yep. And I'm the, yeah, I'm the new adult and senior programs coordinator. I'm based at the Gladstone Community Education Center. And I've been in that position for about a little more than two months. So brand new. And this is our mission. So it's to end, uh, this is the mission of the senior center. Okay, so it's to enhance the quality of life of adults by promoting, sponsoring, and coordinating programs and services that advocate for independence and well-being. And um, so I'm responsible of four programs, so adult and senior enrichment programs, uh, adult with disability programs, uh, Meals on Wheels program, and then the Harmony Community Garden. And uh, I'm just um, going to go over the uh, six dimension of wellness. And then, uh, so you have like the physical wellness, the interpersonal and social wellness, emotional wellness, intellectual wellness, environmental wellness, and spiritual wellness. And if you look at all of our um, adult um, enrichment classes, they pretty much cover every single item on this list. And um, it's kind of like the wellness continuum and then so everything is kind of like interrelated. And then if you change in one dimension, it affects some or all of the others. Okay, so that's what, if there's, there's one missing, then it's nice to kind of like maybe take a class in order to kind of compensate and get that. There. And then the six benefits and enrichment classes, it's to uh, connect people who might not meet otherwise. And a lot of people, for example, like I taught uh, uh, French for travelers. And then so people met in my class and they kind of like they stay French. And then the following year, they actually went to France together. OK, so and then also it's to uh, claim your place uh, within a wider community and then to improve soft skills and confidence among our students and also to prevent the dreaded brain drain. You know, it's always nice to kind of like do. Uh, there was like a study that says that if you uh, take classes, it's actually better than just to do social events, okay? And then uh, to also give every learner a chance to shine, and that's really uh, true with the uh, adult with disabilities, when they take classes and they're able to do something, a project, where they kind of like succeed in a the sport, they're really proud of themselves. We just uh, did the T-ball tournament uh, last Saturday, and you could see like, you know, they were all very happy to get their certificate and their medal and they did really uh, great. Uh, and then to bring also new students and to keep existing students engaged in the community. Uh, so uh, for the adult enrichment, uh, we offer a wide variety of classes and we cover like type of like adult academy, like language classes, uh, creative arts, uh, music and dance, uh, business and finance, culinary, uh, technology, home, and health and wellness. You know, and if you get your catalog, you'll see on the first page, you know, this is all of the different uh, categories. So this is, um, so um, um, like between uh, 2022 and 2023, you'll see like where, uh, where, what the adults are interested in. And um, the main interest is health and safety. You know, people signing up for health and safety classes. Also any enrichment class, and then uh, the academic also classes, okay? And then uh, we have uh, a lot of students in the fall and in the spring, but we also have some students in the uh, winter and a little less classes in the summer, okay? Uh, for uh, the senior enrichment, we serve about like 1,200 participants uh, that come like a, a, uh, to our programs on a regular basis. And at the Golden Prom 2023, uh, the adult ages range from like 52 to 91, with the medium age being like 78 for a golden prom. And then, so uh, it's the the, um, the Gladstone 55 plus. That's the the, the name of the uh, of the club, and it serves about like you know 14, uh, 1,500 participants, and they're about like 
uh, almost 600 visits, okay? So people coming uh, for uh, duplicate numbers because they're coming for different classes. And they so they come for special events, they come for the defensive driving classes that we offer, the health and safety and recreation, so all of the different games and domino and things like that. And then, uh, or, and then you can see the, the next one is the class attendance totals, and they come like during all year round. Okay, so in the summer and fall and uh, winter and spring. And this is just the attendance for the classes that we monitor during the day. So we don't take attendance at night because there's no one. And then, uh, so it's just like the people coming and using the uh, senior center at Gladstone. So all these are all the uh, different activities. So we have senior cardio and strength. So all the, the bingo, dominoes, 500, cribbage, pinnacle, like every single week, tai chi, Mahjong, that's a new class this year. And then the, uh, the Nordic walking group and foot clinic once a month. And then uh, the 55 plus uh, defensive driving that we offer like the eight hour course and the four hour uh, refresher course. And then we have also special big events every year. So the holiday tea around Christmas and then the sweetheart dance around uh, Valentine's day and then crazy Daisy in the spring and then garden prom and end of spring. And then the Gladstone Gardeners, where you have seniors and uh, children from the ECFC planting, uh, you know, uh, seeds, and then uh, uh, checking them, like you know, every um, every week. Uh, and then, if you can click on the video, yes. Oh, I don't think maybe I didn't. Okay, you, yeah, you can check the video. So the. Uh, no, uh, yeah, another program is the, uh, the Community Bridge uh, Adult with Disabilities program. And so we're part of consumption and we're heading to consumption. So, uh, and then, um, so the same thing, we offer a lot of uh, classes. There are you know, usually each uh, school district offers classes and they can attend to all of those classes across the, uh, this area. And then these are like, we, so we had about 1,600 participants and they're mainly interested in recreation. So for example, uh, all of the um, uh, games, uh, we, did, uh, we did the T-ball the, the, the uh, tournament and then uh, like the, uh, um, the ice cream social. So there's a lot of kind of like activities like this. And then they come uh, all year round. So uh, in the fall, in the spring, uh, 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 in the winter, and then also uh, uh, um, they attend all of our classes over the summer. And then the third program is Meals on Wheels. We have about 142 volunteers, which represent about uh, um, 3,500 hours. And then uh, in 2022, we serve about 10,000 meals, uh, and we had about 123 clients. And then uh, now in 2023, as of May, uh, at the end of May, we were already at uh, 6,500 uh, meals. So we're definitely going to go over maybe 12,000 uh, 12, uh, meals this year. And then, as you can see, there was a little drop after, uh, after the COVID. And then it's kind of like, uh, and that's uh, for everyone. That was for uh, all of the other programs as well. But it's going up. It's going back up now. And then uh, we just did um, um, a, a survey just to see how uh, people were uh, happy with the program. And then so they were over, um, they were, it was very positive and uh, in terms of like quality, value, and willingness to recommend the program. And then also, uh, uh, the, uh, so 98% uh, said that they really liked the meals. And then uh, we also, the second part was the, to, um, if it helped them to continue living in their home and to improve or maintain their health, and it was like 81% as well. And this was a comment on one of the person who, uh, who answered the survey. It says, I am uh, grateful to receive these meals, and I look forward to eating well-balanced and healthy meals. It helps me stretch my uh, social security disabled insurance, what is left after I make uh, my mortgage payment and utilities. These meals help me with portion control. That was a 65 year old from Maplewood. Uh, the last program is the Harmony Garden. We have 28 uh, plots at uh, Harmony Learning Center, and we have about 22 households just uh, um, uh, uh, 
working those plots you know, over the summer. And we give priority to the Harmony students first and then returning gardeners to uh, every new season. And then if there's a new person, then we add them at the end. And then, thank you. Do you have any questions? Um, thank you for the presentation. I, I really enjoyed that. Um, my parents are seniors and I'm like, oh yeah, they could do that. And so <laughs> that kind of brings me to my question is how diverse are the, is the Gladstone 55 program? And do we, do you see a lot of older folks of color or? Um, uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes, we do. Is like there, for example, yeah. yeah, just like, I was just wondering like ling if language barrier is an issue like for some of the, the elders who don't necessarily speak English as well. I think if they come, like say for the for the recreation, like for the games, I think that kind of like it's really easy to to get into a sit at a table and just play the games. Uh, so we have mahjong, for example, and they come and they kind of like play it without really having to speak too much. But if I, I could, uh, and, well, go ahead, Jordi. Yeah, and then there was uh, last time we did also for the Crazy Days. It was a magician, so you don't really we just you know you just like. I know when we, we looked at this an, a handful of years back that um, the demographics of our 65 plus community in District 622 was still predominantly white. Um, we know that's changing and so um, that might be something we could pull some data to start to look at, you know, um, looking at the data of our, our community over 65 and then also the number of those who are participating so we can start to look more closely at that. I know the last time we looked at that a little more closely, there was um, not very much uh, diversity, uh, non-white community members mm -hmm. taking advantage of it. And I know they've been doing some work in that area, but that might be an area we could pull together more data mm -hmm. for future reporting. Because I think you're right, it's, it's gonna be really important to continue to monitor that. Thank you. Yeah, so my question is around also uh, um, demographics, uh, but also, but more uh, social economic status. Uh, and the question is actually for Christine and maybe Paul, for both. Uh, it's, it's around uh, 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 financial accessibility. So I was wondering, are we mandated to serve all the seniors in our communities and if so, because I know uh, some of these are fee-based and, and so they do gain some income, but how are we reaching out to the individuals who have not, mm -hmm. can't, can't afford these services? They're also in our community. So can you, can you talk a little bit about? Actually, I'm gonna turn that to Jordy as well, because okay. he's the one who does the outreach, but how, can you talk a little bit about that for uh, those yeah. who, um, who maybe can't afford the classes, how, that we, how we handle those? Yeah, so, um, so uh, like for example, for the Golden Prom, the price of a ticket was just $10. So it's like very accessible. And, uh, and then uh, uh, for all of the clubs, like things that like, all the classes that happens like every single day, then they, most of them are free actually. So mm -hmm. the bingo is free, so I just, uh, yeah. So they're free because we have a lot of volunteers. Uh, and I, I, yeah, where is the funding coming from? No, the, 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 the classes, they Maybe run, they, they they run themselves. Yeah. Some are led by the, the participants themselves, but Tamara can speak a little bit right. to that. We are so lucky that we are uh, volunteer rich and resource rich, with the, even within our own staff members who step up and, and teach classes and do extra activities outside of their job description. Um, but community ed does receive state funding that we use across all of the different program areas. So every year when we're doing our budgets, which I know is a wonderful topic for you all, mm -hmm. um, that we have to make those decisions of where we can put money, what, what programs need the most, uh, and then really capitalize on all of the things that have already been built by previous leaders, such as Cheryl, and now Jordy's st leaning into that. Um, but so yes, we do have fee-based programs. We try and keep the fees as low as possible, and it is supplemented by the community ed budget. So the classes, uh, the cost of classes are not always covered by the fees. Community ed 
we have this bucket of money that we use in order to fund for our adult enrichment and our senior programming. So it's kind of you know blended in order to provide those opportunities. So it's not perfect, and we're always looking for ways you know to keep prices down and. And we get donations from the community as well that really help in some of our senior programming and our Meals on Wheels as well. So it's it's really a joint community effort and with the community head budget. Does that answer? Okay. Yes. Yeah. And we, we also um, we also have people sponsoring the event. So they, for example, they pay for the dessert and things like this. So. Yeah. Um, thanks to all of you who came Thank out. You. Um, it's nice to hear about the adult programming because we hear so much about the K-12. So thanks for taking the time and thanks for the work you do. I want, I wanted, hi, my name is Jed Helwig. I serve as the activities director at North High. Um, I wanted to add that I was able to attend the Golden Prom and Jordy did a great job talking to all the individuals there. They just, they didn't like the black coffee. They wanted, no, I'm totally <laughs> But. Um, uh, question uh, answer to you is uh, North and Tartan students also volunteer at that Golden Prom, mm -hmm. and so that's how they kind of get that going too, right? So, anyway, uh, hi, my name is Jed Helwig. Um, I serve as the activities director at North High School for the last 17 years, um, and I'm just going to talk about North and Tartan athletics and activities and participation and all the great things that are going on. My colleague Brian Munter was not able to come tonight, so here we go. We prepare, plan, and play to win and compete at a high level, but winning is not our purpose. The purpose of our athletic and activities programs are teaching and learning, human growth and development, and connecting with students to caring adults. Involvement, we have many different opportunities to get involved. This is just three basic pictures. Uh, uh, that's me right there with the North High fishing team. We wrote a grant to the Minnesota DNR, and we uh, luckily got the grant. And so what we do is take some Saturdays and Sundays, and we rent a pontoon boat, White Bear Lake, uh, Bald Eagle, and we take out a group of students, the first ones that get, get their uh, permission slips back in, and we take them out, and we just go fishing, and I drink my coffee and drive around, and they fish. No, I, I fish with them too. But anyway, so that's the first picture. Second thing is... Um, is that together we make a difference conference. So this was uh, working in collaboration with the Minnesota State High School League uh, and the Forbes group. And this is just a conference uh, that happened across the state of Minnesota uh, that we pulled in a bunch of different schools from around the area to say, how can we make our events, athletic activity events, more um, uh, uh, collaborative with all different schools from a sportsmanship perspective and other di different areas. The last picture right there is our JROTC. They're presenting the colors at uh, a football game. These are just three pictures of some of uh, the activities, at least at North High. And there's more pictures to come, but that's just, just the start. So from an athletics, activities, fine arts, and clubs perspective, these are the different offerings. These, these include sports, speech, debate, drama, robotics, uh, ASA, which is uh, Asian Student Alliance, uh, Black Student Union, eSports, band and choir, just to name a few. So these are the offerings at North. Uh, activities offers 41. Athletic opportunities, 32 of a total of 73 opportunities. Tartan, uh, 36 activities, 32 athletic opportunities, and 68 total. When we look at activities, uh, that includes the clubs. Some clubs continue year, year after year. Other clubs can kind of fade away. So th that number is <clears throat> a little, um, like Tartan might, might have not have continued with the club that specific year. Um, and it's all uh, student interest based. Every two years we uh, run a survey and see what kind of interest we get from our uh, student body and we adapt and, and uh, provide different opportunities that way. Next is the overall rate of participation in extracurricular activities, meaning everything. It's, these are the combined schools of participation rates. As you can see in uh, 2019, we had 77% of our student body, both at North and Tartan, uh, per participating in something. Um, and then you see the year uh, 21, the COVID year, uh, obviously went down and now we're uh, rebounding back up at 69% in, in 2023. Uh, we call that just basically uh, the extension of the school day. Um, and uh, from an athletic perspective, what we're going next is, um, uh, um, activities or athletic-based education. 
So an example would be during the summer, it's not athletic based. And you can show up, you don't have to show up to school, you don't have to be on class on time, you don't have to do the right things in the community during the summer. During the school year, uh, the education-based athletic opportunities says you, you need to do all those things to, in order to be part of our programming. So athletic participation numbers at North and Tartan, um, you can see the number of student athletes uh, from 2019 all the way back to uh, now 2023, we're rebounding in the world of uh, uh, student athletes participating in, in our programming. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that too, but the next slide talks about um, just the activity and club participation. Um, you know, North specifically, because I can speak to that, and Tartan also over, uh, offers over 40 to 50 different activity and club opportunities to get involved in. Um, you know, from, uh, I mentioned earlier, ASA and Asian Student Alliance or Black Student Union or robotics or uh, there's, there's numerous different opportunities there. So um, you can see from 2019 at 15, 19, and then 617 and 21 during that COVID and now we're rebounding back up. Participation rates uh, by race. Um, What's not down here is the native uh, Hawaiian and other Pacific Islanders. It's too small of a sample size to include, but um, you can see here the percentage of extracurricular pr participants identifying as Asian has increased dramatically over the last five years. From 21% to 35% of all participants. You can see that in the purple line there. The addition of girls badminton and boys volleyball has increased partition rates uh, in our Asian student population. Rates in general uh, in line, are in line with the overall demographics of both schools, uh, except for the Asian students, which is on the upward trend, and that was the addition of the last two uh, uh, athletic opportunities that I mentioned. Here we're going to just brag about North and Tartan with just some different pictures. Uh, these are some super fans cheering on our North Cross Country team. The North girls swim and dive before a home meet, ready to go at our brand new uh, or a year old John Glenn pool, so thank you for that. Uh, the fall musical, Little Shop of Horrors, uh, was at North. Uh, North and Tartan Adaptive Soccer in the 2023 state championships uh, uh, that was held at Stillwater High School. And now Tartan. Tartan fans packed the stands for a Tartan football game. The fall musical is Newsies. Uh, Tartan students ready to cheer the adaptive soccer at the state tournament and Tartan football players give back to our local community. I know my colleague Brian Munter and myself, one of our, the things we do in our preseason meetings is we push hard to reach out to the local communities, uh, whatever that looks like. It, it could be volunteering at the food shelf or, or whatever that means, but go out and reach out to our local community and give back. Uh, winter season. Uh, North and Tartan Adaptive Floor Hockey at the 2023 State Tournament. North Knowledge Bowl team uh, showing off their ribbons. Rock the North Show Choir. If you haven't been able to swing by North High during the Rock the North Show, we have thousands of people who come to Rock the North. And, and uh, what this is, is a big show choir event. We include um, outstate show choirs to come in and it's a wonderful event. And there are a ton of volunteers and it's a big production. And we transform North High. So come and check it out next year. Polar, uh, this is the Polar Cheer Team supporting North Basketball. Uh, and here's Tartan. Tartan Dance Team competes uh, at the section tournament. Tartan Boys Swim and Dive Team cheers during, during a meet. The Robo Titans, which is their robotics teams, compete in the 10,000 Lakes Regional Robotics Competition. Uh, and the Tartan Band performs at the Gopher Men's Basketball Game at Williams Arena. Here's the North High Clay Target team competing in Pryor Lake. The boys are North High Boys State Volleyball team. They finished fifth in the state in volleyball. They were undefeated in conference, so we had a wonderful season, uh, our boys volleyball team did. Had an opportunity to drive out to Shakopee and watch them at the state tournament, so that was fun. Uh, adaptive bowling team at the state were, uh, these individuals were state champions. And then I talk about the, or you know, show about the Polar Service Day. It's us reaching out to our local community, kind of giving back. I do want to brag about our adaptive uh, programming. And uh, this year, uh, we had state appearances in the fall in adaptive soccer, the winter in adaptive floor hockey, and the spring in adaptive bowling, we had state champions. And so 
across the board, our adaptive programming, sometimes we're co-opt and other times we're not. Uh, but is, um, I, I want to brag about them because we show up and we win. And it's, it's awesome. And you should see the smiles on their face and on our students' faces. Spring uh, for Tartan. Uh, Tartan Boys volleyball team poses for a photo during the inaugural season. There's the Tartan Boys team. Uh, hole in one and, and a grand slam for Stone Reich and Sarah Lambert in the same week. It's a big day, big week for the, for, for the Titans. Seven ta Tartan students signed national letters of intent to continue their academic and athletic careers at the collegiate level. And the Tartan badminton team huddles together during their senior night. Uh, both Brian and myself are out to tell our, the wonderful story about both North and Tartan athletics and activities and what, uh, and there's different ways. Uh, I'm active on Twitter as, as so is Tartan and so for twi Twitter, Instagram, through uh, district communications. Um, we, tr we try to get our uh, name out there about all the wonderful programs and things that we offer at both North and Tartan. And every day we get to impact lives. We get to work to impact the culture and programs and a community. We get to connect caring coaches and teachers with students. We get to walk the halls where we can high five a student who did something in a the game they didn't know was possible, or we get to straighten a pathway of someone who is off course, or lift someone up who had a tough event or, or uh, game, or talk to and influence a coach or teacher who matters in the students' lives every day. We get to get up every day knowing we have an opportunity and a responsibility to matter to others, to make a new day better. Why we play, our purpose, and understand that you get to serve. We get to serve our coaches, advisors, teachers, our community, and most importantly, our students. So tonight I want to thank uh, Superintendent Tucci Osorio and the 622 Board of Education for the opportunity to serve. And that's all I have. Any questions? <clears throat> Terrible microphone. <laughs> all right, thank you, uh, thank you for that. Um, that's just really heartwarming to see all these these activities. Um, is I just am wondering, is there a list of all the clubs and activities uh, so that we could see? I'd be happy to give this to you. This is a, a oh. activities handbook that both North and Tartan have their own, similar, but you know, and it offer it shows every so every freshman that comes in, every or every new student gets this book, right? Wonderful. And so, yes, I'd be happy to We share. can get copies for the board of, of both schools. Yeah, I just, you know, yeah. the, there wasn't a robotics team or esports or anything when, right. I, you know, when I was in high school. So I'd love right. to see So um, this explains everything, and it has all the details in it. So I'd be happy to share this with everybody. Yeah. So thank you for the presentation. I know that uh, the school board, I, in one of our sessions, we were talking about uh, how uh, some universities and colleges are emphasizing on on the GPA, and we were talking about how activities also do count towards uh, admissions too for the students who are unfortunate not to have uh, the good scores. So thank you for what you do. Uh, but so my question: I'm a North parent. I do root for. Um, uh, no, I'm a Tartan parent. I oh, do oh, yeah. root for. Um, so you root for the Polars too? Yes, <laughs> okay, I cool. do. However, I did enjoy the friendly feud between. <laughs> I, I, I've always enjoyed that. Yeah. But my question is around that about collaboration. So when my kids were in high school, uh, I know that in marching band, it was combined, both North and Tartan High School. Uh, together, and I just recently attended an event, the cultural event, where it was also combined all, all the schools, but some of the clubs for high schoolers were both North and uh, Tartan together. So I'm wondering if you can talk about some of the collaborative um, activities that are between North and Tartan High School, and not just the uh, f friendly feud type, but uh, actually working together as a district. Sure, yeah. So from an athletic perspective, I'll speak to the athletics first, and it, not unique to, it's not unique just to athletics, it's all about activities too, but there's a thing called co-oping, 
okay? And so through the Minnesota State High School League, we co-op with Tartan specifically in adaptive athletics, meaning we work together to provide opportunities for kids to be part of whatever athletic opportunity that might look like. So for example, it would be in both boys and girls hockey, we co-op with Tartan. So our families, our student body, our mascots, our jerseys, everything, have to align with both North and Tartan. So there might be a polar patch here and a Tartan Titan lightning bolt here or something like that, makes sense. And so um, we co-op with uh, Tartan in a, in a bunch of different areas because we still wanna provide that opportunity at North and at Tartan if our numbers are low. So we decide, hey, let's come together, provide that, still provide this opportunity, walk the halls of North High, but still have this opportunity, if that makes sense. And so um, we're collaborating all the time and aligning with different things from a, from a handbook to just providing opportunities to uh, our student body so everybody can get involved. Yeah. Um, I think what you do is so important. And so thank you for your work. Um, do you find that these activities are where students find common ground where they and can you say some more about that because I mean it's such a difficult time to be a teenager in in this mm -hmm. community in this country I mean I'll we hear so much about depression and anxiety and social isolation um, can can you say some more about how how this, um, you know, helps <laughs> these activities and participation helps. Yeah, so I, I can speak to my own personal experience. I have a junior at UW Stout. He was a robotics quirky boy. Uh, didn't fit the athletic mold, if that makes any sense, or that track. And so uh, I lived it firsthand, like how can I get my son involved beyond athletics? because he didn't, didn't want to do athletics, and that's fine, right? And so um, I was able to, and that's why I continue to say, hey, when somebody drops off a form, let's say they want to form a club, right? And so we align it to our mission and vision and all that other stuff, but I really sit down with those individuals and say, hey, why do you want to do this? What's it, what do you want to do? And it's connecting in different ways. Athletically, you can connect kind of as a team, in esports, you can connect as a little team, and and of course, friendships evolve and all that other stuff that uh, you know happens with that. And so, um, just being a good listener to our students when they come into the office or whatever, because it's a passion of theirs. Otherwise, they wouldn't spend the effort to come to our offices and say, "Hey, I really, I really love this. I would really like to start this type of club or whatever it is." Right, and so. Um, Constantly listening. I just think it's especially interesting when um, someone who um, who thinks you know who maybe is they're in the football world, but then they decide to just give theater a try, you know, and all of a sudden they're finding you know friendships and blossom. Ming, where they didn't uh, didn't uh, expect. So I give uh, I give your coaches and your volunteers and your and uh, um, you know your underpaid staff <laughs> so much credit for for helping students um, you know realize their potential, plant those seeds. Yeah. So yeah, thank you. Can I just make a comment about that? I know Christine's talking about strategic planning next, and I was at the strategic planning meeting, and there were students at my table who said the most important thing about school is the sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. And I think that the athletics and the activities give all of our students a sense of belonging. I'm super happy to see that so many of the students are participating, and I also appreciate your enthusiasm mm -hmm. for you know supporting the students and for making a place for all of them. So I do think the sense of belonging is, um, I mean, it's super important. So thanks for your work. Yeah, and we, you know, um, both North and Tartan, uh, obviously in our offices and in, in the daily activity of what's going on are always inclusive to everyone as far as 
what their needs and wants are, right? And so we, we try to uh, accommodate all those across the board. Yes, and also Charlotte made a comment about higher ed, and one of the reasons why higher ed wants students involved in athletics and activities is because they're more likely to succeed. And I believe the same is true in K-12. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So it's just really important mm -hmm. work. Well, numerous essays that they have to write, let's say, for an application or whatever, talk about their opportunities they had beyond the classroom. Mm -hmm. You know, um, whether it's service day or whether it's part of a team, or they talk about that and their experiences in that. If I could just make a comment too, um, and it probably goes without saying, but it's important to recognize that for our ADs, um, Jed and Brian, to be, to, I was just thinking when you said 17 years, that the amount of evenings and weekends that they give up because of the nature of their job away from their family is, is pretty astounding. And um, it's, it's amazing to me the passion and energy that they have. And, and I know um, the willingness to work with students when they want to create a new club or sport or activity, or like, you know, really working with them. And, and um, you know, I don't know if it's, Jed, you know, is a former special education teacher, and he has a real knack for paying attention to what students are trying to do, what they'd like to accomplish, and how, how to make it happen, and helping them take their ideas and bring it to life. And so um, it's really an amazing job, uh, a huge job, and, and just so grateful for the leadership of our ADs because it's, it's unbelievable the impact they can have on our students. And, um, and of course, a lot, a lot of time away from family. So thank you for that. Well, thank you. did they get the volleyball approved? So. I know, absolutely. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Lots so of work. You can brag about that. Mm -hmm. Yes, and we will continue to do that. <laughs> absolutely. All right, thanks again. Yeah, thank you guys. All right, next on our agenda, we have Christine's strategic plan update. So, um, Madam Chair, Directors of the Board, I'm going to give a short little update on strategic planning. I know that throughout the past year, you've seen some timelines and things, and you'll continue to see more of these. So. I'm gonna to try to keep it brief, but I wanted to show you where we're at in the process. I know that Michelle mentioned already, having been involved in that. Um, just kind of a reminder of the purpose of our strategic plan, providing the direction to our board, governance, budgeting priorities, um, it'll guide the work of our staff. And it's also gonna help us communicate to, to our broader community what our priorities are. And um, as a reminder, our last strategic plan was adopted in 2016. Um, we tried uh, a few times to get it refreshed before then, but then got pretty sidelined by the pandemic. And, and of course, the last um, year or so has been, was last year was really busy with a lot of our school closures and boundary changes and all of that happening. So we're really thrilled to be actually um, moving forward with this. Just a reminder of kind of our working timeline was to kind of start with a lot of um, stakeholder input and gathering this spring, um, getting our core planning team together to start reviewing existing data. Um, and then collecting um, data and, and starting to do some feedback loops. Um, if everything goes as planned, we would have our board adopting um, uh, a new strategic plan by this December or January, um, depending on how things, how things move along. And so, um, as you know, we've done a lot of um, events this spring, world cafes and surveys and all kinds of um, efforts to try to bring in um, multiple perspectives and, and gather some perception data. I wanted to talk a little bit, our core planning team, and Michelle mentioned this already, um, and, and I wanna, first of all, issue a quick thank you um, to a couple of people who've really helped with the heavy lifting. Uh, Amy Luckner, our REA director, was amazing in pulling a bunch of data together, and Lynn Fahm, who oversees our Office of Equity, has been an amazing um, planner. We've spent many hours working together, and then, I know Julia's not here today, but she did a lot of um, data collection and, and recording of data for our High School World Cafe events where we had um, high schoolers come together and share their thoughts, ideas, and suggestions on their experience. So um, 
shout out to that and 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 all of cabinet and, and many others who've been involved in the work along the way as well so we started uh with the core planning team which came together of about 65 people and we had students and staff and um, we had a number of school board members there as well. Charlotte was there, Michelle, Nancy, and Julia. And there'll be some more opportunities along the way. Um, but this happened um, last Monday, and we spent a whole day together. And we started by really diving deep into all of the outcome data. And these are some areas we, we dug into, literacy, math, science, graduation and college and career readiness, time for learning, which included attendance and suspension data and some staffing data that we had as well. And then the team also then spent uh, a good amount of time digging into perception data to help us deepen our understanding of, of some of the original data that we started with. And so um, we really looked at student relationships, um, student health and wellness, satisfaction, uh, suggestions for how they'd like to see things improve. We really also looked at data that was collected through staff um, perception data organizational alignment, inclusion, um, and staff satisfaction as well. So we, we did a lot of deep dives into that. And um, we are in the middle of reviewing all of the data that was collected last week to look at what other data is missing, what other pieces do we need to be collecting this summer, are there additional feedback groups, uh, focus groups and roundtables we need to host this summer. Um, and then the core planning team, we're going to be organizing um, into some initial buckets of, of what the data was showing us. And then we did another follow-up as well with all of our administrators last Thursday. Uh, we were together for uh, all the morning and we did a lot of digging into much of that same data to collect some additional feedback and input from them. And so this is just a, a quick reminder of our timeline and where things are at. Our plan is that um, by the time staff come back in August that we'll have some of those big buckets identified and we'll be able to start getting feedback loops from our broader employee group when they come back as well as our families and students as well so um, we're kind of in the middle of of this uh rolling up our sleeves and unpacking all of the the pieces of it um and because there's some preliminary work happening i didn't want to identify what the the buckets basically are the big overarching areas where we think we're going to need to focus our energy for the next three to five years. A typical strategic plan will last about three to five years. And um, it's even after those deep dives into the data, we're starting to see some themes and buckets emerging and we'll be refining that throughout this summer. So very exciting work. Um, and we're trying to as well as unpack the work, make sure we have a very large cross section of stakeholder representatives at the table because in order for a strategic plan to be well invested in by um, our whole stakeholder community, it's helpful to have openness and transparency of the process. And that's part of why we've cast a very wide net in the number of people involved in the work so that, um, and then we're also documenting it as well. And our communications team had folks collecting video and, and uh, photos as well so that we can be documenting the process along the way as well. And so um, really, really excited to have that work finally underway and and uh, and lots of cool progress happening as well. Um, I threw in just a few photos from a couple of those gathering events. So to, just to kind of give you a sample of it. And, and this is again a very, very brief um, overview because there's going to be more of these coming along the way as we start to refine these buckets of work. So with that, um, comments, questions, I know several Folks here were in the in those meetings already, and and um, we're very excited to share with you all the 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 raw data that came out of it, as well as the the refined buckets as we kind of move them forward. So, comments, questions, thoughts. Um. Yeah, thank you for presenting. I, I I was there and I was really I was more impressed with this how many student representatives we had. Mm -hmm. I was really uh, glad that they took the time in their busy summer day. Yes, <laughs> they could have been sleeping at home, but they came. So I was really impressed, and I was also very impressed with how engaged they were. Mm -hmm. uh, they took it very seriously, and uh, yeah. They so. sure did. They were amazing. Yep.
And many of the students that were there for this core planning date were also students who helped us facilitate table discussions during our World Cafe events at Tartan and North. And so they've been, they've been deep in this stuff for uh, you know, over a month now with some of the activities that they've helped us lead at the buildings to get the raw data in the first place. So really fun to see the, the leadership skills of our students. Next steps, just be expecting. There will be a regular along the way. Um, we'll be doing uh, more updates, especially as we head into the fall. Um, but this timeline actually mirrors the same timeline we followed in 2016. We kind of started with uh, a lot of gathering of stakeholder input. Um, and we'll, we'll quantify those that input by the numbers as well when we, along the way, in addition to producing an end result of a strategic plan, we also want to have a, a document that also documents the process um, in the interest of transparency and um, helping people who maybe weren't at the table but were, were part of making sure that they can kind of see how these all, all came together. So we intentionally did not predetermine or pre-sort data into buckets. We wanted the group at large to kind of do that work together so that they could start to, based on the, the feedback and, and data that they were reviewing, help us to determine what those bigger, broader buckets will be. And so it's, um, it's pretty exciting to see it already starting to take shape. All right, thank All you, right. Christine. Mm -hmm. um, next on the agenda, we have the finance, and first we have the acknowledgement of contributions and elsewhere. <clears throat> Uh, Minnesota Statute 123B.02 permits school boards to receive, for the benefit of the district, bequests, donations, or gifts for any proper purpose and apply the same to the purpose designated. In that behalf, the board may act as trustee of any trust created for the benefit of the district and for the benefit of pupils thereof. Therefore, the Director of Finance recommends the following resolution. Be it resolved by the School Board of Independent School District Number 622 that the School Board accept with appreciation the following contributions and permit their use as designated by the donors. Uh, Jody Moran donated $500 in support of the North High Robotics Team. Karen Grutzmacher donated $200 for Meals on Wheels. Best Buy donated $6,000 in support of the North High Black Student Union. Maria Marino made an in-kind donation of a Hoyer lift in support of 622 students with physical needs requiring transfer support. And Dottie Bingman <clears throat> donated $6,000 to the John Glenn Middle School FACS Department <coughs> in Richmond. All right, thanks, Dan. Oh, All right, thanks, Dan. That brings our total fiscal year contributions for 2022-2023 to $58,043.95. Can I get a motion and a second to approve? So moved. Okay, moved by Paltzman. Second. Second by Natardi. All in favor, please say aye. 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 And all opposed say nay. Um, thank you again to those generous donors. Um, next on our agenda, we have our budgets. Good evening, members of the board, Superintendent Tucci Osorio, and fellow cabinet members. Um, Two items today, uh, final 2022-23 budget revisions um, and the proposed 2023-24 budgets for next year. So um, we've gone through most of this information and data uh, in the work study session. I'm gonna go through it again um, briefly, but please let me know if you want me to elaborate or go into detail in any section or slide, uh, happy to do so. so. Um, when we're talking budget, the first thing we generally will look at is enrollment, uh, specifically average daily membership, ADM. Uh, the bulk of our funding is driven by enrollment, specifically ADM or weighted ADMs. So brief reminder, overview of um, how these different enrollment metrics are calculated, what they mean. So enrollment throughout the year is measured um, based on when a student is enrolled with the district. So um, entire 
the entire year would be a 1.0 ADM. Um, if someone is enrolled for half a year, 0.5 ADM. So adjusted ADM factors in students coming in and out of the district, so those that are residents and non-residents, um, the kind of net total is uh, the number that we, we look to. And when we talk about ADM, that's the one that we focus on. So in total, how many students are attending or being uh, are attributed to the district's adjusted ADM total. On top of that, there are weights that are applied to adjusted ADM. So grades 7 to 12 get an extra 0.2 weight applied. And so it is that adjusted pupil unit that many state funding formulas use to establish how much districts and charter schools receive in terms of state funding. And state funding is a majority of the funds that we receive. So these, these numbers, these estimates are important. They drive our revenue estimates and can uh, establish if we're getting more money, less money, regardless of if the state legislature has increased funding, which in this year they have increased it. But at the same time, the district continues to face declining enrollment. And so um, it kind of counters these legislative increases that we're seeing. So just there's a slight breakdown between adjusted ADM. There's the actual students served within our district, those that are served by other districts in which that ADM is attributed to us. We get the associated revenues from those students, but then have to go and pay those districts for serving those students. So it's a small component, but it does add to our ADM total. Um, but that we then kind of turn around and pay out tuition or um, invoices for services rendered by other districts. So here is just a grade level breakdown uh, over the last five years with this year's current estimate, next year's projected estimate for ADM. Um, for the most part, this year we're projecting that we are going to stay even, slight decrease of five ADM. We won't actually know, even though the school year is done, what those final numbers are. There's lots of um, kind of edits, uh, reviews that are done to confirm that between our district and another district are there dual enrollments that go on. So we won't know that final number for, for, for at least a couple months. Um, and that can continue to change if there's audits that go on and they will start to pull records and make slight adjustments. So this year we're kind of seeing a small decline, relatively stable enrollment uh, is the current forecast preliminary totals. Next year we are forecasting a slight decrease, 0.8% decrease, and that's mostly just using various models that are factoring in the fact that we've had multiple years of declines and that de those declines are slowing, so we're kind of continuing that trend and again, maybe erring towards the side of being a little conservative in the hopes that we do have more students, but I wouldn't, to not have the scenario in which we're overestimating ADM, overestimating our revenues, and then we'll have to make adjustments mid-year. Easy to see all of that visually here in the graph. So solid blue, solid orange, those are actual final numbers for a average or adjusted average da daily membership and adjusted pupil units. So for the most part, projections for next year, continuation of recent trends, um, again, 0.8, decrease, uh, a small amount, but um, hopefully conservative. Hopefully we see things leveling off or even a slight increase. Again, as things return to you know, post-COVID times, boundaries have been settled, schools have been um, open for a while and um, kind of can have been established. So a lot of factors that can impact enrollment and um, you know, hopefully to the positive. So with that, I'm gonna go over our revisions for this year. Um, these are mostly high level adjustments based on actual expenses or revenue changes that we've factored in. Um, we haven't had anything change since we last discussed this a couple weeks ago. And we really only adjusted a few um, funds. So our general fund, our construction fund six, and our health insurance fund. So 
general fund, the adjustments we had are just additional expenses that we didn't fully account for in the budget, and so we've added those expenses because they've occurred and we need, we're accounting for them. Uh, and then the addition of additional, the additional use of SR3 funding, we've spent money, we're using our SR3 funds to cover that, so the expenses are matched by an additional increase in the revenue side. On the construction side, the revenue adjustments are just a change from when we had preliminary estimates on our revenue. Um, the biggest change there being we had a large placeholder for uh, the sale of bonds, and so we've gone through with our LDF bonds for the year, adjusted down to the actual number. And then uh, we did have a big change in January when we revised the budget for our health insurance fund. We've made another adjustment this at this point because we continue to see high costs related to healthcare this year. So we're self-insured and when those costs go up, when more of our employees are utilizing those services, that falls to the district in, in some ways. And so we further adjusted the expense estimate for those funds um, again. So in total, um, across all funds, total expenses are around 344 million. Um, I'll focus on the general fund, that's the one that where most general operations for the school district sit. Um, the one that I think um, is the, the most concern, the one in which we are forecasted for this year to have a $9.1 million deficit. Um, even with that deficit, even with these adjustments that are mostly in the negative, uh, the one metric, the main metric that we look at and um, I think helps to evaluate the financial health of the district is that fund balance to expense ratio. So 9.1 million is the deficit for the general fund, but we still maintain um, over 18% fund balance to expense ratio. In particular, the unassigned fund balance in which those funds are not currently set aside or cannot not restricted to use in one particular way on or certain expenses uh, remains at over 10 percent. So board policy is 8 to 10 percent. We are estimating forecasting just a little bit over 10 percent for the end of this year. So again, very good that we had a strong fund balance to weather the current situation. Again, increased expenses, the um, change in enrollment and from COVID and new boundaries, I think all of those have played into negative impacts to our district and to our budget in particular, but we had a strong fund balance in which we could weather that financial storm, still maintain uh, enough savings, enough of a cushion to feel secure and ability to operate going forward. And in particular, the unassigned, the kind of free funding available for us is still within that top range of what is board policy. So are there any questions, anything that I can help address for this year's budget and the final revisions? Just a reminder, so Paul is presenting uh, first on revisions to the current budget mm -hmm. and then Next, you'll be hearing about the, the budget for FY24 for the coming school year, the proposed budget. So this is specific to the current school year, FY23. And I know this is the same presentation you gave in the study session, and we had, and I know you just mentioned it, but the health care, we had 2 million additional so we utilized, especially, so that's um, Fund 20, and I know it's probably hard to see uh, unless you're actually looking at the computer screen. That's where our costs have been quite high. It's just really a matter of what the use is by our members, and so we have eaten into that fund balance by $2 million, and that's basically 25% of that fund balance. And again, that was especially strong. We've had a lot of money there, and thankfully we did because of this year that we just had. Is that? Yes, or thank did you. Have you. A and just question? like to kind of summarize the 9 million that we're taking from the fund balance. Mm -hmm. 
it's two million from the um, health care and um, they're separate. So f the general fund that's fund one has its own fund balance okay. um, and both assigned and unassigned within that. Um, fund 20 is our health insurance. Okay. And so there's a separate um, restricted fund balance there in which those, that fund balance can only be used to cover our health insurance related expenses. Okay. Yeah. And so then there's 9 million in the general fund. There's, yeah, so we, we have reduced our fund balance in the general fund by 9.1 million. Um, and I focus on fund one mostly because that is where the school district really operates for the most part. Um, we have fairly healthy fund balances across all the, you know, from our food service, uh, community ed, construction, debt service, um, health, dental, our OPED fund, all those are in very good standing, strong standing, and the general fund is, it is the focus on what we would look at um, in terms of financial health, and it is where we are currently facing the deficit this year. So um, we have been fortunate to have a fund balance and be well above board policy and requirements, and so um, because of that, even though this is not a good financial year, we're incurring or taking on a lot of costs. You know, someone intentionally, someone understood, and we knew this going in because we had this money in which we could do that. Mm -hmm. We could see how things settled. We can not rush to any adjustments that could have resulted in, you know, now having to go back and. If I could add a, a follow up as well. So, just as a reminder to the board, um, last year at this time, when we saw that enrollment decline from the pandemic had not rebounded yet. We had a discussion about whether or not that was going, do we believe that was a permanent enrollment decline? Was it gonna, was it, pen, I mean, obviously it was pandemic, it was triggered by pandemic. And um, with the labor shortages that we've been facing uh, in, in the field of education in general, um, we were really reluctant to um, lay off staff to right size for that enrollment loss because ha if those students were to come back, then it would be really hard to get the staff back because once you release them, their other districts are going to snatch them up and we're not, it would have a hard time staffing those positions. And so we made a conscious decision last year at this time, instead of laying off staff to right size for our enrollment loss, we made the conscious decision to keep the staffing levels at the levels they were at and then uh, wait to see. Obviously, once school starts and we see whether the students are coming back or not, it tells us um, whether or not, you know, this looks like it's going to be a long term. And so um, because enrollment uh, did not rebound, we now are at that place that we we had thought about being at last year, but we were a little nervous to release staff that early on. And thankfully, because of our strong fund balance, we were able to, um, you know, obviously stay above our board approved minimums for our fund balance policy. Um, but, and of course, um, hope we were, we had hoped that those numbers in student enrollment would, would rebound back up. Um, but, uh, and of course they still might over time, but at this point we, you know, did do some layoff of staff this year for the coming school year because of that enrollment decline. Mm -hmm. I think the last thing I'll note, and so I, I've stated the forecasted fund unassigned fund balance expense ratio right now is over 10%. Um, when I presented this earlier, we we were still not yet finalized on fiscal year 24's proposed budget. And at the time, any deficit forecasted projected in the next fiscal year, we actually incorporate that into this fiscal year's fund balance. So I had stated a lower unassigned fund balance to expense ratio then, because I was basically reducing our unassigned fund balance, knowing we had the current forecast of a deficit next year. So only a positive change from then um, with updated numbers on fiscal year 24. So. All right, I'm gonna move on to next fiscal year and I think we can, I'll get through everything and then we can do the resolutions if that works, unless we want to pause right now to do fiscal year 23s. Okay. 
So for fiscal year 24, um, here is the overall summary. So the across all funds, expenses are a little over 300 million. Um, and I'll go into, you know, I'll briefly touch on every fund. But um, so I think just went over 344 million was this year's budget, 300 million. Looking at all funds, the drastic change is, is not something I would focus on or look at. Construction expenses were high this year and then are projected to be as high next year. So um, again, the, the focus, I think what's most relevant, we'll be looking at general, the general fund, fund one. Um, and uh, given the legislative changes, despite estimating a declining enrollment, we are, for the most part, forecasting a balanced budget next year. Slight negative change to the fund balance of 150,000. But for the most part, revenues are mostly matching our expenses. So maintaining um, kind of status quo when it comes to the fund balance. So forecast right now, again, a little over 10% unassigned fund balance to expense ratio. So I'll go through the slides. Um, and I might go a little bit quicker this time, but let me know if you've got another question or something to review. But for the most part, a lot of these haven't changed, and I'll go over fund one in more detail since that's somewhat new. So on uh, fund one, our general fund, uh, we're estimating about 185 and a half million in revenues, about the same amount in expenses, um, slightly more in expenses. So if on the revenue side, speaking to the state legislative uh, changes that have occurred, so increases to the basic formula allowance, um, positive adjustments just to compensatory revenue, and then um, the special education cross-subsidy, those are all leading to big contributors to $15 million increase in our revenue, so 8.8% over this current year. Um, that is countered by some decreases on the federal revenue side mostly utilizing less, we have less ESSER funds, COVID-related funding in which we, we have or utilizing next year. So um, on the expense side, still an increase of 6 million, about 3.4%, and that is driven by increases in salary and wages. So as I mentioned, fairly balanced. We're still, we still have expenses estimated to be higher than revenues, but it's essentially a rounding error of 150,000. So the eight, the total fund balance expense ratio is estimated to be 18%. The unassigned fund balance expense ratio is estimated to be 10%. So within slightly better than the required eight to 10% unassigned fund balance expense ratio that the board requires. I went over this really quickly, but on the revenue side, we, we saw when we presented the property tax levy a few months ago, that is increasing. That's driving the increase in revenue. General ed from basic formula allowance going to 4% this year to compensatory revenue, having nearly $5 million increase. Special ed education is um, due to the increase in cross subsidy is driving some of this increase in revenue from state funding, as well as um, what will be a large forecasted expense is the, a, a change to who qualifies for unemployment insurance also has in that law that we would be reimbursed for that additional expense. So we are forecasting nearly 2 million in increased unemployment insurance related expenses that next year the state has funding set aside to reimburse or cover that. So um, those details are st still not fully known, but um, at least for next year, we're fairly hopeful that any excess increase or excess costs increased in the unemployment insurance will be um, paired with increased aid from the state. Future years, that is less certain or less known how that will actually work. So um, it kind of nets out to zero, but those are the leading things that, that have driven our increase in revenues. And as I mentioned, the Federal revenue side is lower than this current fiscal year. We're utilizing less of our COVID-related funding. So ESSER 3 is about $6.1 million less than we what we utilized this year. And again, those funds 
we're not getting more. So the federal funds will continue to go down eventually. And so we're making use of them now. We have them um, very well planned out and thought out, but eventually those will go down um, because they will be expended completely. Can I ask before you move off that slide? So there was lots of things at the legislature that impacted K-12, but we didn't understand how it would impact us. And these bullet points, I'm guessing, are at least some of the ways, but I imagine there's still other ways that we don't understand or. Yeah, there will be some, these are the, um, these are the main drivers of the change. So there's, there's already a few of the other adjustments that have been made that have incorporated in here. So I think on the EL revenue, that's having an increase as well that we factored in. It's just, these are the really big buckets that contribute to that huge 20 plus million dollar increase. So there are, there's lots of those in which we know what those rates would be, what that increase is, where I've included in our revenue model, they're reflected here. But there are, there are so many in which we don't actually have all the details yet. So I, for the most part, haven't included those. So I haven't made a guess on. So this, again, hopefully is on the more conservative side. We have additional funding for all these other programs that maybe haven't fully been um, released by MDE or we don't have good estimates yet. So those aren't captured here yet. Mm -hmm. I heard several conversations and maybe they were just exaggerating that they were gonna, you know, that the, the unemployment insurance especially was gonna destroy districts financially, um, but this estimate doesn't reflect that obviously. Our, and you're saying we're getting the money back next year for the unemployment, at least for the next year. There's, there's just one fixed pot of money in which they have set aside to reimburse everyone and so it's supposed to span multiple years. I would be surprised if it does. No one really knows how this is going to, from the expense side, fall out or like play out. But um, our unemployment insurance generally is like 60,000, 100,000. This is a huge increase. And it is for sure a concern in future years where we won't have aid. So unless something changes, that's a huge expense in which we don't have any kind of revenue to help counter it. And I'll add that the unemployment insurance factor, there's a, there's a funding side to it, but there's also just a staffing side to it. Um, we had seven people, Trisha just told me today, seven people just resigned from summer school just now. So we have more, and that's, there's more than that. that. That's just what we knew about just today. Um, that we're going to work summer programs and now are not. So I think, you know, I think that's probably going to be felt all around the region as well as as that information gets out there. Understandably so. I mean, it's it's and and we certainly want unemployment insurance. We want the best for everyone. We're just going to have to come at it from a couple of different ang angles as well as not only the financial piece but also how to stay fully staffed for summer programs. Yeah, I don't want to spend like. A ton of time asking questions because I, I know I can ask them offline, but just to clarify then the seven people would otherwise not have been eligible for unemployment insurance, but now they are. Mm -hmm. And so then also there's the expense of then hiring seven new people to replace right. them. So we, we then pay the, the unemployment insurance, of course, but then also um, there's the challenge of trying to get people who want to work in the summer and willing to, you know, work in the summer as well. So. Um, again, noble, noble legislation and understand, and we all support the idea of it. It's just the way it, the, the, you know, some of the impacts on school districts, we're going to have to keep navigating our way through. And that 1.9 million that I have an estimate on, it, it could be 3 million. It could be 1 million. I think it's, it's uncharted you know, waters and we don't really know. Um, there's been a few models put out and we looked at those and that's kind of help, what helped guide that number. Um, again, next year, hopefully it is a neutral expense paired with that state aid, but we really don't know the true impact until um, we see things play out, I think this summer, you know, 
And that might even not be the full picture. People may not act. They might act after that if they hear news of it. Yeah, it's kind of an unfunded mandate. Even though it had good intentions, it may have a drastic impact to the district in future years. So on the expense side, it's the increase of six million is really driven by increases to employee pay and benefits. And within that, the benefits is where the unemployment insurance lives. So that 1.9 million is what's really driving that increase on the benefit side. Um, but basically, there's a list of you know what is our staff for next year? What are the roles with the FTE? And so we modeled out you know people's step and lane change, changes to longevity, and any associated roll up, roll up costs. So increased um, you know movement on the salary but also just potential increases to that salary matrix, um, changes to our underlying benefits, so health insurance increases, dental increases, and all, and all those kind of things. We put estimates and included those potential increases here. Uh, everything else kind of had a net decrease of about 2.1 million, so in total, that huge revenue increase also sees uh, somewhat of a Increase to the expense side too. So 6.1 countered against that 15.1 million are the 15 million increase in revenue. So here's all that data with a few years of history included, including the proposed fiscal year 23 revised budget um, and where we stand now. So 18.7 total fund balance to expense ratio down to 18% um, fund balance to expense ratio. Again, fairly balanced proposed budget for next year, so that unassigned balance, um, based on what we're um, forecasting on the expense side, still maintains around 10%, a little over. Um, again, same data, just visually displayed, but um, increasing both on the revenue expense side, but Thankfully, these two lines are basically even, and we can kind of see that, you know, that fund balance, we had a, you know, we're having a drop this year, but it say, stays somewhat level going into next year. And then this is just kind of the breakdown of the, both the revenue expenses, kind of the source and, and groupings of where they're being spent. So um, the rest of these slides you have seen with no changes at all. So just, again, fairly consistent from year to year, fairly stable or planned or known expenses. We don't have as much variability when it comes to a lot of these, or we have very strong fund balances to help support um, any expense estimates. So food service, uh, uh, this is one in which there, you know, this is, there's some changes with the universal lunch pass. So I think these estimates, just for transparency, they could maybe shift a little bit more than in, in other years because, again, we're making some assumptions and some guesses on how things will operate and how things will flow through next year. Um, but still, a fairly balanced budget. Um, in total, small negative change in the fund balance of about 120000 But we have a strong overall fund balance. So even though we might be uh, somewhat balanced, somewhat, somewhat going to eat into that, we'll still be financially fine um, given the situation or if things turn out to not be as um, we're currently estimating or modeling out, we do have a fund balance to help support as things are changing um, with the new legislative changes. So um, community ed, same kind of story. Uh, both on the revenue expense side, we're not seeing much changes from this current year. Positive change to the fund balance of about 67, so fairly balanced. And uh, even then, there's still a strong 33% fund uh, balance to expense ratio. So it's great, very strong over a number of years, um, um, and no major concerns at all there. Construction. Uh, this is driving a big change to overall expenses from one year to the next. So 94 
and a half million is the total expenses for this year, and we see that next year it's only 43 and a half. So again, plan projects. We've got the, uh, and then a huge deficit, uh, both this year and next year is because we have fund balances, we've generated the money to help pay for these projects. It doesn't always fit into a given fiscal year. We're drawing down on those um, funds to pay for our planned expenses. And I think I've always heard we're doing very well, either on schedule, under budget. So mm -hmm. again, healthy, strong, no, no major concerns here. I just wouldn't be concerned if you see year over year big swings or changes. It's just the timing of when revenue is generated and when the expenses actually occur. Debt service, so paying back um, and, and payments on um, bonds and um, other scheduled, very well known in advance, so no, no surprises here. Um, Again, it's just the, here's our scheduled payments and it's drawing down on the funds that we have. This is the one in which we did have a large change from what we initially forecasted in this fiscal year. That's where we're seeing that $2 million, $2 million hit. But again, thankfully we had that strong fund balance. So next year we're continuing to forecast out high expenses. We've increased the actual estimate on the revenue is how can we pull that in. So we're somewhat balancing and not trying to draw too much to our fund balance next year, but a lot of that can change based on negotiations, based on how expenses actually play out. But conservatively speaking, high expenses trying to match now. Again, hopefully it's not gonna be quite as high. Um, but even then, we still have a strong $6 million fund balance in the event that something doesn't go as rosy as um, we hoped or that this isn't truly conservative as, as it's modeled out. Um, dental's pretty strong and we don't really have um, um, too much variation. So not a big, you know, while health insurance has gone up quite a bit this year, it's not the same case for dental. It's just structured a little bit differently. So for the most part, um, no major changes in terms of the revenue and expense forecast for next year balanced estimate, um, and we do have a fund balance to help support that at 17.5%. And OPED funds, these are other post-employment benefits. So when we pay our retirees for, you know, the benefits that they've earned after working at the district, we have funds available to support those estimated payments. And so um, we can draw down from those funds and we have a lot of money in which we won't likely generate or take out additional funding. So we are mindful to be um, somewhat conservative that we don't spend it all down our fund balance when it comes to OPEP fund, but um, we do balance it out with retirees pay premiums. Um, we utilize the general fund to, to support some of these expenses when we can, but it's a balance between utilizing these funds that are somewhat one-time funds. We won't likely go out to get it additional influx in cash related to OPEB. Um, but again, these, nothing here in which we're seeing huge skyrocketing costs or anything different. So um, that, that what I would say would be concerning. And yeah, OPED, we have, like I mentioned, we have um, um, prior funding that we've received and so we're paying off unscheduled debt service payments. Well known when we took those out and um, just uh, schedule drawdown. So that's the really quick review of everything. And so I can go back to this uh, all funds summary page. Anything else that I can address or any questions that I can answer? No, it doesn't look like it. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, I'll do, I'll read the resolutions. Mm -hmm. um, so for the budget revision first. Um, be it resolved by the School Board of Independent School District 622 that the 2022-2023 district budget be revised as per the attached listings of change. 
and those changes are available on the website and from the business office. Um, can I get a motion and a second for approval? Move by Second. Second by Livingston. All in favor say aye. Aye. And all opposed say nay. Um, okay, that one, that was a budget revision. And let me pull up the other resolution. So the t fiscal year 24 preliminary budget um, be it resolved by the School Board of Independence School District 622 that the 2023-2024 preliminary budget be approved as follows. And again, it's available online or from the business office. Can I get a motion and a second to approve? So moved. Okay, moved by Peltzman. Second. Second by Natardi. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 And all opposed say nay. Okay, that is also approved. And thank you to everyone who worked on that. Thank you, Paul, for presenting on that. Next, we have operations. Good evening, Sorry. everyone. Um, I'm back again with our annual insurance renewal, um, and that's for our property, our liability, our umbrella, auto renewal, amongst other things. Um, this year, we are seeing an increase of 14.8%, um, which is, believe it or not, less than we were expecting. Um, most districts are seeing 25%. Um, increase and that is really um, related to several factors that we're seeing in the region just to share a couple things with you one market inflation as we know construction prices are going up there's been an increase in storms that have been classified as catastrophic one of which we experienced last year May um, 2022 where we actually saw one million dollar claim to hail damage on our buildings just wide and there's been an overall increase in errors in emissions claims in the region, which has also boosted that up as well. So specifically related to the increase in what we're seeing, our district received updated property appraisals the first time in eight years, um, which were undertaken in 2014 and then last November. Um, we saw an update in auto claims from our fleet this year, which is not only our bus fleet, but our grounds maintenance fleet. And of course, I mentioned the May 5th, 2022 hailstorm. Um, so the, what you have in front of you is a resolution for the fiscal year 24 insurance rates, which also include work, workers' compensation. Um, we're going to see an increase of approximately $225,000 over last year, bringing the estimated um, uh, renewal rate at $1,755,679. So I recommend approval of the insurance rates for fiscal year 24. I'll answer any questions that you have too. All right, thank you, Sarah. Um, I'll read the resolution. Mm -hmm. okay. Be resolved by the School Board of Independent School District 622 that the insurance renewal for the district's fiscal year 2024 property liability umbrella and workers' compensation insurance be approved as follows, and it's listed there on the website or from the business office. Can I get a motion and a second to approve? So moved. Okay, moved by Livingston. Second by Yang. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 And all opposed say nay. Okay, that is approved. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, next, we have uh, the superintendent. Yes, yeah, so um, the next item is just a, so uh, a resolution, um, basically for the dissolution of the Summer Academy program. This is a program that is jointly hosted by 12 Minnesota school districts, um, Anoka, Hennepin, Centennial, Columbia Heights, Forest Lake, Fridley, Matamidi, Mounds View, 62, Roseville, St. Anthony, New Brighton, Spring Lake Park, and White Bear Lake. And this is a program that has been around for, um, I'd have to look up how long, quite a while. It's a program for high potential students, um, gifted students. It's a, it's a collaboration between these districts. Um, it hasn't been hosted in 622. We aren't either the fiscal host or the physical host of it. Um, 
the fiscal host has traditionally been Columbia Heights and the, the uh, fiscal host and then the physical host has been Roseville. And um, due to declining enrollment um, and some financial oversight issues, um, that collaborative has made a decision, a recommendation, a very um, challenging and difficult decision to, after this current summer, to dissolve that joint collaborative partnership due to kind of lower enrollment in the program. Um, and so obviously as a member of, of a 12 district collaborative, um, we are just bringing forward the same resolution as all of our member districts that are part of that are, are bringing forward as well. It still does not impact programming this summer. It's for the after this summer. Um, and so we'll, we'll have to take a look at our enrollment and our program offerings. This came about pretty recently. So um, after this summer, we'll kind of take a look at, you know, our enrollment trends over time and what, what we might want to offer in district going forward to be able to kind of pick up and serve the needs of students who are already enrolled in that program. Can we find out a little bit about how many students are going to be impacted? Students from six to two, not the rest of the district. Absolutely. Um, I'll have to double check what our enrollment in from six to two is for this current summer. I don't, do you know that number? Seven. Pre-COVID it's 70. Pre-COVID it was 70 students, seven zero uh, in the summer programming. And we don't know the current numbers for this year yet. No, this year they are. It's next year that it, yeah. 39, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so as you can see, uh, 39 students down from 70 pre-COVID. So um, it's a fairly small program, but um, you know, we'll definitely be taking a close look at, at the kinds of offerings and the, and the interests of, of our families for that area and see what we might offer. We could easily do something um, similar through our own community education program and a summer camp type thing if we need to as well. So, I was sad to see this because I know lots of kids who did it mm -hmm. really liked it. Yeah, but I do know it was really expensive. Yep, and, and it's all funded through by families. So families pay for the program, and I, I believe there's a sliding fee to some extent. But there's it's a lot of out of pocket for families, and and I think perhaps we could, you know, if we look at the history of that, um, we might be able to create something even stronger in-house going forward. Okay, I'm gonna read the resolution. Yep. Okay, be resolved by the School Board of Independent District 622 that the Joint Powers Dissolution Agreement for Summer Academy are approved and further, should there be any documents requiring signatures that the school board chair and clerk are authorized to sign the documents attesting the documents. Um, can I get a motion and a second for approval? Move by Yang. Can I get a second? Second. Second by Livingston. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 And all opposed say nay. Okay, that motion is approved. Um, next we have school board and we need to set a closed session. So I recommend that we set a closed session to evaluate the superintendent on July 11th, 2023 at the District 622 Ed Center immediately following the adjournment of the 430 board business meeting. Can I get a motion and a second to approve that? So moved. Second. Moved by Peltzman, second by Livingston. Um, any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 And all opposed say nay. Um, so we have that is approved as well. Um, board communication. Dan, do you have anything? Uh, I'm glad that she's still here. I just wanted to thank, it was Clara. I just wanted to thank Clara for sharing um, at the, the public comment tonight. Um, I just want to say that we, we had um, both uh, North and Tartan High School graduations the past couple of weeks. Was it last week? I, I, I'm, I, 
Yeah, yeah. sometimes, yeah. Sometimes in the last couple of weeks anyway. Um, so yeah, it was really good to see uh, many parents and students and everybody all excited about graduation. So it, it was really a, a joyous moment to see the end of the school year activities. Yeah, I just want to echo Charlotte's. Um, it was really, I thought it was it was very cool to see how each graduation celebration was different. It was unique, but at the core of it was an embrace of the you know individual achievement of each student. Um, I especially really appreciated the fact that um, the high schools were allowing cultural stoles and the decoration of the caps. I felt like the students seemed really excited about that, and it, and it but it still felt really uniform. So um, I know when I was in high school, we weren't even allowed to throw our caps. So it was, it was very, it was, it was fun to watch them throw their caps. So, um, but I appreciate that, yeah. All right, and also congratulations, Kita, on your graduate and your son, Jake, right? Jake, congratulations. Um, our next board meeting is July 11th, 2023, a business meeting at 4.30 in the boardroom, which is, you know, normally we're six, so that one's 4.30. Um, is that one, the one that we're followed, that we're following with the closed session? Yeah. And then we'll follow with the closed session. And then August 8th, 2023, work study session, August 22nd. 2023 business meeting at 6 p.m. Um, is there anything else before we adjourn? If not, can I get a motion and a second to adjourn? So moved. Okay, moved by Livingston. Second. Second by an attorney. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Uh, meetings adjourned. Thanks very much.